Radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Two men elected to Parliament in 2010, both of them in their 50s, Guy Opperman is a government minister. Toby Perkins is a Labour frontbench spokesperson. They're united by something else. Both men open up about the trauma and grief of baby loss. Coming up... Labour shadow minister Toby Perkins. You know, walking into the church that five months before I'd been married in with two tiny coffins in my arms. Employment minister Guy Opperman. I took a week off when, and the house was sitting at that time, uh, when the boys got sick and then died, and then I went back to work. Also in today's show, we speak to Vince Cable, former Lib Dem leader. Who was the most difficult Conservative to work with? Uh, Michael Gove has matured, I think, become quite an interesting politician, more open-minded. But at the time was a you know a real clever dick. I always felt he had to score the last point in any conversation. All that after your news. I'm Ray Addison in the GP newsroom. The Health Secretary is being urged to stop grandstanding and make a deal with unions ahead of NHS strikes this month. The call by former Health Secretary Stephen Dorrell comes as military personnel prepare to cover striking public sector workers. Around 2,000 troops, civil servants and other government volunteers are being trained to help limit disruption during the festive period. Mr Dorrell says demands for a 19% pay rise may not be possible, but the current offer is not good enough. Most people remembering this, the uh, applause that we all gave to the NHS during the pandemic would think that 3% isn't, doesn't properly respond, in particular for low paid NHS workers, doesn't properly respond to the challenges of the moment. And I would hope that Steve Barclay would come out of the grandstand and engage with the people who he, he relies on. He can't deliver health care sat in the Secretary of State's office. Well, meanwhile, the Rail Delivery Group says it hopes to prevent further train strikes by offering members of the RMT union an 8% pay rise. The deal would be spread over two years and includes a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies until April of 2024. Momentum is building with England getting ready for their knockout match against Senegal at the World Cup in Qatar. The game kicking off just under an hour's time. The Africa Cup of Nations holders were runners-up in Group A, while over in Group B, the three Lions beat Wales and Iran, but could only draw with the USA. England will also be playing without Raheem Sterling, who is dealing with a family matter. Despite that, England fans in Qatar are optimistic. I think it's going to be exciting. I think they're going to press high. Um, should be quite good. I reckon we're going to be... I reckon it's going to be 2-1. That's what my score prediction will be. No, I know they're the champions of Africa, but I watched them in the AFCON and in the group. I don't think they're all there. I think we'll be fine. You might go to penalties, but he thinks 4-0. 4-0. I think you'll go penalties. Kane hat Yeah. Well, she'll score tonight. Everyone's slating him off. He's going to get a goal tonight. 
Well, back here, the head of the police watchdog has been forced to resign over an historical allegation. It's now emerged that Michael Lockwood, who's been Director General of the Independent Office for Police Conduct since 2018, is facing a criminal investigation. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, says she told him to quit or face immediate suspension after learning about that probe. When he announced his resignation on Friday, he said it was for personal reasons. Preparations are well underway for King Charles's coronation, which takes place in just 150 days. The St Edward's crown has now been removed from the Tower of London to be resized. Its relocation was kept secret until it was safely delivered. The ceremony on May the 6th is expected to be much smaller than the late Queen's coronation. Around 2,000 guests are expected instead of 8,000. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll have more at the top of the next hour. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking cold and cloudy for many with showers feeding in from the east. Let's take a look at the details. In the southwest, it'll be mostly dry, but there could be a few showers. There should also be a few breaks in the cloud. In the southeast, it'll be largely cloudy. The cloud will stop temperatures from dropping too low, but it will be cold with some rain too. Much of Wales will have a dry evening with the best chance of any clear skies in the southwest, with showers further northeast. It'll be a cloudy end to the day across the Midlands. Some showers are likely, but they will be intermittent and mostly light. It'll be a different story in the northeast. The showers will be frequent and heavy at times. The showers could fall as sleet or snow over higher ground. Western parts of Scotland will stay mostly dry with clear skies, meaning it will be cold. Further east, we can expect more cloud and wintry showers this evening and overnight. Meanwhile, across Northern Ireland, we can expect some showers, mainly towards northern and western parts, with some clear spells in between, but perhaps not as chilly as last night. Showers will continue to feed in from the northeast overnight with chillier and clearer weather in the west. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Toby Perkins, uh, Labour MP for Chesterfield since 2010, now uh, a Shadow Education Minister. Let's start by talking about your education, actually. You're one of the few MPs who didn't go to university. I mean, I think, I think what's more important is the contribution people make rather than what they, uh, their background is. But I think that it does give you a different perspective. I was on a YTS scheme at the age of 17. Um, what were you training to be? In, in salesperson, basically. I was in telephone sales uh, in the IT industry and, and stayed in that for sort of seven years. Um, I, I have came, come on the back of um, sort of both my parents having been academics. Um, but also uh, my mum, uh, after my parents split up, having sort of pretty uh, tough time being out of work and so on. Um, and, and I think it was just maybe my response to, to what I'd seen and, and also just who I was at that point. You know, I wanted to get away from studying and school and wanted to get into to an adult environment, really. Your marriage broke down in 2018. You fell in love and started a relationship with someone who was employed as a member of your staff. It got in the papers, got a fair amount of negative um, press attention for you. It must have been very hard for everybody involved. I mean, it was. I think when it came into the press, um, it actually already happened a few months before. Um, but you're managing really difficult situations. I was managing really difficult situations. It was just after Christmas, the first Christmas I spent with my kids. So, you, you know, you, all your focus is on the people who are suffering around you. It's not, a, you know, it wasn't about me personally. Um, but I was very conscious of, you know, my kids had already um, been through a tough situation. Amanda's kids have been through a tough situation. That's your current partner, Amanda. Uh, yeah, and, and the, you know, the last thing I wanted was to, um, to sort of bring everybody who was, you know, already in pain 
uh, into the sort of public eye in that way. And there's also, you know, whilst the, the sort of the main headline uh, might be true, there's numerous inaccuracies in what's being reported. And so you, you do feel uh, very powerless, really, to, to sort of respond to uh, much of that. Um, and, and, you know, I was still very new into a relationship that was it was going great, but, you know, also feeling the pain of the, that it was causing other people. So it, it is incredibly difficult. And uh, it, it's obviously the, the downside of being in the public eye in that way. Are you OK now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm great. Uh, obviously, you know, still conscious of other people who have suffered. And I think it is difficult when, you know, on the one hand, I'm absolutely certain I did the right thing in terms of, you know, my own happiness. And, you know, I think that's important for those people around you. But, but you also are conscious. I mean, you know, been a child who went through a, um, their parents splitting up, you know, um, bringing that to, to the door of my and Amanda's uh, families, you know, was, was really difficult. And you talk about, um, you, you were married and you were married for a long time and you have a son and a daughter. Um, but early in your, 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 your marriage, um, you and your wife lost twins. Tell us about that. Do you ever get over something like that? Well, I mean, so we were married in, in 1996. Um, within a few months of, of being married, uh, my wife was pregnant, we were told uh, that she was expecting twins, you know, tremendously exciting. Um, the, you know, you go and have the scan when you discover not only, you know, not only got one, you've got two. Um, and then in January, she was in poor health uh, for a lot of the, uh, for a lot of that month. And, you know, we, we ended up going back for a scan sort of to check if everything was okay, if her poor health had had a, an impact. Um, and then we get told um, that we can only find one heartbeat. And, you know, you realise that this means that, you know, a baby's died. And I guess at that moment you sort of think, well, all right, we've still got one. But actually, you know, the reality is very quickly uh, my ex-wife's uh, body uh, kind of gave birth to the, the dead child, my son Joshua. And within a few moments, you know, gave birth to uh, my daughter, uh, Jennifer, who was, who was alive. Um, but was only 23 weeks into the pregnancy. I think nowadays might be more of a chance of, uh, of survival, but we had about six hours uh, with her and, and then she died also. Um, and I think, you know, the, the two things that really will always stay with me from that is, is the first, is that moment when you, you first hear. Uh, and the second is, you know, walking into the church that, five months before I'd been married in with two tiny coffins in my arms. Um, and, you know, the, the wail I remember that came from my mother seeing her son uh, with her two grandchildren, you know, in, in his arms. Um, it, it, it's obviously, it's something that no one, you would never want anyone to, to suffer. Um, and, you know, there's a part of you that has that, goes through that grief. And, um, you know, a little bit of you sort of dies in that moment. Um, and, and, you know, immediately my ex-wife was very ill. So we, we had, you know, a short sort of period of time where the focus was on, on her health. Um, and, and obviously, you know, coming to, you know, tended to come to terms with what had happened. But I think we were also both of the view that we wanted to conceive again. Um, and within 12 months of, uh, of my uh, twins dying, our twins dying, uh, we, we, um, my son was born. Um, in fact, his due date was the, exactly a year on from, from the, the birth date of, of my twins. That wasn't actually when he was born. So, you know, we were obviously heartbroken that the twins had died. We were blessed that my son was born. Um, you know, a terrible thing happened, a great thing happened, the great thing wouldn't have happened if the terrible thing hadn't have happened. And so you take solace from that. And, uh, you know, it's, I think, you know, in terms of the resilience that y you need to show and, and in terms of the way that we responded, 
you know that, you know, to an extent there's nothing to be scared of again. You're never going to maybe have grief like that again. So it, it is, um, it's, it's incredibly tough. But, you know, human beings are remarkably resilient and, and you come through. If anybody is watching who might have had a, an experience like the one that you and your ex-wife went through, is there any advice you can give? I think everyone, everyone just finds their own way. Um, you know, some people will uh, need to sort of spend you know, a lot of time um, and, and sort of repeatedly in, in years uh, going forward acknowledging it. Others will, will handle it in a different way and I don't think anyone can tell anyone else how they should handle it. Everyone sort of finds their own way. But I think it's the same thing I'd say about any grief, you know, losing a parent um, or any other, is that, you know, the, the acuteness of the grief will pass. Um, but that's as much as I can say, really. You know, and I think, I think for us, and uh, you know, we're in a better position than, than some others, in so much as you know, fundamentally there was no reason why my ex-wife couldn't have more children. Sometimes you know, people going through this who, who've had miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and uh, you know, it's all the more uh, possibly brutal for them. But, um, yeah, we say so my son was born, um, and then a few years later we adopted my daughter, um, and, uh, it, you know, it was, uh, so life goes on. Thank you for speaking so, so openly. I think it will help people. It's hard to listen to, never mind, mm. go through. Um, another thing I noticed about you, I noticed a, a few months uh, ago, you've got a hearing aid. Have you always had a hearing aid? Did I just, because we were in the same intake when we, we got elected at the same time and I never noticed it. Is that just me uh, being a typical self-absorbed uh, member of parliament doesn't notice anything else about your DL? Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, so I've, I've had hearing aids virtually throughout my time in, in parliament. Um, I mean, I first noticed I was going deaf in my early 20s. Right. And, uh, or, or that I got a hearing loss, I should say. And um, I, I really... It, there was a moment where it was really sort of getting worse quickly. And I remember in my mid-twenties at some point just kind of praying that I might be able to function into my mid-thirties. I think I can get to 35 where I can still hear, can still work. You know, I was envisaging, you know, being invalided out and, and not being able to work. Um, and I thought if I can just have a few years, I can put food on the table, you know. Um, but it, it, you know, wasn't that bad. Um, it did sort of stop escalating and, and it's fluctuated a bit over the years. Um, but it is difficult in Parliament. You all know that Parliament's a very kind of whispery yeah. uh, workplace and it's a very noisy workplace. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of walking and talking and uh, a lot of kind of under the breath uh, conversations. And I, and I find that difficult. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, that maybe... Was, was part of Amanda and I coming together was that when she was working closely with me, so the extent to which she became my ears. And you know, one of the things that where it really um, it poses an issue is a lot of MPs will go to schools and do kind of, uh, this is what an MP is. And I love doing those, absolutely fantastic. But uh, I find little seven-year-olds at the back of the room pretty tough to hear. Um, and so, you know, I, it, you'll get someone asking a question and, and you know one of the worst things about being deaf is you ask someone to repeat something once that's fine when it's second three times uh, you're asking someone to repeat it um, it gets embarrassing for you it's embarrassing for them and so eventually you, you just kind of pretend you've heard and and she you know she was great uh, in, in that regard is great in that regard and, and I think it was one of the things that kind of um, maybe uh, brought, brought about that connection. Um, but it is, you know, it's a disability, it's a, it's a difficult one because sometimes people think you're being ignorant because they think you've ignored them, uh, or people think you're stupid because you're answering a different question to one they've asked you. Um, so, you know, I have, you know, huge sympathy for, for everyone who uh, is deaf. And, uh, and it's, you know, there's also much more of a stigma about it. People are really fine about wearing glasses yeah. um, but wearing hearing aids it's, we, we start much more uh, sort of shy about that and so um, you yeah, know I'm, I'm kind of in a way glad that you didn't notice in another way you sort of think people might you know maybe it'd be better if they did notice you know covered a lot of ground there 
Um, you've been very open. I've really enjoyed listening to you. Uh, thank you, Toby. I really do feel like we've learned um, the real Toby Perkins today. Thank you. No, thanks very much. Cheers, Glory. Coming up, it's Vince Cable's Life and Times. I, I suppose in practical terms, I, I didn't know how serious it was or how long it was going to last. But um, I think my instincts was to sort of cover this up. And clearly that was a mistake. Employment Minister Guy Opperman. It was a very long week where we tried to keep the boys alive and uh, one came and went rather quickly and then we spent four or five days trying to keep the second child alive and sadly um, that didn't happen. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets in exclusive interviews. I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Coming up, it's Vince Cable's Life and Times. Farage should have been in Parliament arguing his case, not sitting outside. I, I, no, absolutely, they should be there. Vince Cable, a Member of Parliament for 20 years, leader of the Liberal Democrats between 2017 and 2019. You stood down at that last general election, all the good people did. Um, <laughs> Do you miss anything about being in Parliament? No, not really. Uh, I mean, I think my starting point was I, I wasn't quite 80, so I felt I was young enough to start a new career, which is what I've been doing, you know, writing books. I'm involved in business, promoting hydrogen infrastructure. Um, and I've, you know, they've given me a professorship at the London School of Economics. So I've got a very full portfolio existence. And if I'd stayed behind in Parliament, it would have been in a rather sad environment. My party would, hadn't done very well. Uh, there was all the disruption around COVID. So I'm glad to be out of it doing something totally different. I deliver my leaflets for the local party, so I, I keep that up. But I, Gosh, nothing, I nothing active and serious. <laughs> yeah. You recently revealed, Vince, that when you were leader of the Liberal Democrats, you had a, a stroke. Why didn't you say anything at the time? Well, it, it wasn't a big stroke, right, the, what they call mini-strokes, but it does have the effect of uh, affecting your speech, your memory and your effectiveness. I, I suppose in practical terms, I, I didn't know how serious it was or how long it was going to last, but um, I think my instincts was to sort of cover this up because my late wife died of cancer, which of course is a totally different order of magnitude of seriousness but she always took the view that she didn't want people to know about it because they then treat you as a goner you know they're very nice but they treat you as a has-been and I think once 
I, I had this instinct that told me that once politicians talk about their own illnesses, people write them off. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. I mean, you saw what happened in the midterm election in America. That guy Fetterman won a you know very crucial state despite having a mini stroke in the middle of it, um, and he flourished on the back of it. So I, I think I made a mistake, but that that was what well, I did it. Do you think politics is something? or anything about politics that is particularly unforgiving? Yeah, it's quite brutal, and, 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 and as you'll know, you, you've been there. Um, it, it's a bit like being out on the African savannah. You know, once an animal is wounded, you know, the, the predators go for you. Um, and so it, it, it's that kind of tough, um, you know, dog-eat-dog -dog environment that you, you have to adapt to. You know, there's no point complaining about it because, you know, you know that's the world you're going into. But, but it, it is a different environment from everyday life. And you were a Secretary of State um, under that coalition government mm -hmm. between David Cameron and Nick Clegg, talking about dog-eat-dog. -dog. Who was the toughest Tory to work with? Well, some of them were difficult. Some of them actually, I wouldn't say they were friends exactly, but I, I, I got on very well with, you know, David Willits, who was my deputy university's minister, you know, great guy, and we, we worked very well together. Um, I managed to get on well with Osborne. I mean, it was actually in private, rather more companionable than he is in public. Um, I think of all the Tories, the most sort of aggressive in a way was Pickles, but I Eric never Pickles. quite got to the bottom of what, what the problem was. Uh, Michael Gove has matured, I think, become quite an interesting politician, more open-minded. But at the time, was a you know a real clever dick. I always felt he had to score the last point in any conversation, and uh, always had to try and get his way. Uh, so yeah, they varied, but but you learnt to the, the, the attitude I had to the Tories I worked with, particularly those in my department, was. You know, leave your weapons at the door because we've got a job to do. And, and by and large, they respected that. I'm fascinated by if there's any examples about Michael Gove being a clever dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, he always had to have the last word in any cabinet discussion. With anyway, he was quite witty with it, but it, you know, you realise the personality like, type. Yeah. <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight of being part of that coalition government, should the Liberal Democrats ever? go into government with the Conservatives again. Can you ever see a scenario where that happens? Yes, I can't see us going into the coalition with the Conservatives for the foreseeable future, actually. I mean, it was, I, th I think if I could summarise it, I think it, the coalition was good for the country, but bad for the, it was de devastating for the party. And, you know, we can argue about all kind of mistakes that were made along the way. Um, I think the fundamental problem was that the party was sort of centre-left. I mean, our natural, instincts were to work with Labour people, certainly mine. Um, I'm perfectly comfortable working with Gordon Brown if he if he got back again. Uh, but the, the, the numbers at, in the 2010 election made it that that was the only way to have a stable government. And we were in the middle of a financial crisis. There was a lot of pressure on us to, you know, get together, form a government, uh, provide stable rule, which is what we did. But it was terrible for the party. Uh, we still haven't fully recovered, uh, and it's going to take a lot of rebuilding to to do that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the party is in a. It should be doing much better um, in the polls. It's a fair distance now since that that coalition government and. Uh, my instinct is people don't love the Conservatives and they're still not too sure about uh, mm. Keir Starmer's Labour, so it would be ripe for a Lib Dem revival. Well, it, 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 it's, it's a bit, you know, a bit of a curate's egg, you know, good and bad. Um, there are, in local government, we've had a big revival, certainly when I was party leader, we had a massive breakthrough, we've done pretty well ever since. Um, we did well in the European elections. There's this underlying support of 20% or so at that time. But I think there's a difference between the national polls, uh, where we're doing badly, and, and the kind of local politics. And it relates to the way the first-past-the-post system operates. We tend to concentrate on areas where we're second and can do well, and we tend to neglect the other areas, which you know un we, we can't win, and it's, it's going to resolve itself into a Conservative versus Labour contest. So I think the Lib Dems will make headway. We'll win seats at the next election, you know, 20 possibly, which would be a you know, yeah. big recovery, yes. even on the basis of a relatively slow overall rating. Coming up. 
Employment Minister, Guy Opperman. I was doing the budget in 2011, and I often say the budget nearly killed me, and I collapsed in the central lobby, and uh, I had a brain tumour the size of about your fist. More from Vince Cable after the break. You know, Labour may, you know, be overestimating their support at the moment, so we could get into a hung parliament situation. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. the Labour Party uh, may not, may be the biggest party and they may need Lib Dem uh, support, they may mm. seek Lib Dem support. What should be the price of that support? Well, I, I, th I think the premise of the argument is that the Labour Party may not get an overall majority and I, I, I think I would expect that because the Tories are pretty ruthless. I mean, even if they flounder for the next year or so, the, the way they conduct elections, as we painfully know in the past, is sort of utterly ruthless and focused. And, um, you know, Labour may, you know, be overestimating their support at the moment. So we could get into a hung parliament situation. Um, I, I think the Lib Dem approach would be to, to be supportive, probably not think about a coalition, but, but to, to support a, you know, new mm. government constructively. Um, and, you know, the price, if you put it like that, will almost certainly be electoral reform. Not simply because it's good for us, but because the system is just not working well. We're getting governments that are unrepresentative, in which small parties, not just us, but the Greens, are basically shut out of parliamentary life, which is not good for the country. Reform? On the uh, right? Reform? Yeah, well, why not? No, I mean, Farage should have been in Parliament arguing his case, not sitting outside. Uh, no, absolutely, they should be there. Um, so I think that would be the price. Uh, I, I think the Labour Party understand that. Um, they've adopted it as part of their party policy. It, I think it would be in their manifesto. It wouldn't then need a referendum. Mm. Um, and it's a question of how, how much they prioritise it. We may, get, we may get a Blair-type landslide, in which case they may take yeah. the view, well, we don't need anybody's help, so we'll forget about them. But I think that's, I would say, one in three, one in two possibility that this could, could happen. OK, um, so you've, you, you've referred to your uh, new writing career amongst the new things that you mm. are doing now. Uh, you wrote a book this year called How to Be a Politician. What, in your view, is the most common mistake that new MPs make? Well, I think, I think in general, politicians suffered from the danger of self-importance. 
that the way I start the book is recognizing that not just in Britain, but in very many countries, politicians are the least trusted of all professions for a variety of reasons. You know, the fact that you have to compromise, you're making promises, you can't keep all of those things. So politicians start with a, with a public trust deficit. And I think you, you, you have to be listening to the public, not treating yourself as a terribly self-important individual, which I think politicians' instincts often to do. So that, that would be the first thing. And I think my second is you, you get a lot of adversity. I mean, I, it took me 30 years from first standing for Parliament to getting in. You know, you have to be patient. And um, people who just give up at the first hurdle, mm. you know, never going to get anywhere. Mm. Interesting. Um, your first wife, Olympia, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1987. You lost her in 2001. H how do you come to terms with watching the love of your life, I guess? Mm. Well, it was a very, you know, loving, supporting relationship, and you know, I was incredibly lucky that, that I had a, you know, lovely woman that I was married to. But um, and it did mean at the end of her life, I was trying to combine politics, a job, and being a carer, which is not easy. Um, but you know, she supported me through very difficult times. I, I kept standing for Parliament and failing, uh, but, you know, she encouraged me not to give up, even when she was ill, you know, which was... And I think politicians who have that supportive, you know, loving family background, you know, are so much stronger for it. I mean, I think we don't often get into the role of a partner in a relationship, but it's often more crucial than, you know, the, the superficial impression would give. Absolutely. Um, you remarry. Right. You're married to Rachel now. Um, I notice that you still have two wedding bands. Yeah, on yeah, your I, finger. I do. Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm one of these incredibly lucky people who's been happily married twice. Um, you know, two lovely women have sort of crossed my path at the right moment, and and it's it it sort of helped. You know, it's, it's 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 one of the great strengths of life, actually, and it, it's not just that, but their families have come together. Um, so I've got a very large extended family. My Rachel has a significant number of grandchildren. I have three, and you know, we're we're not an extended family in the old-fashioned sense, but but virtually, um, sometimes in real time. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 a great strength and happiness in life. Yeah. You were in Strictly Come Dancing in the Christmas show. You love ballroom dancing. Mm. Is there anything about Strictly Come Dancing we don't know? Uh, <laughs> well, I was, being, I was pushing the boundaries a bit because I was a cabinet minister at the time, so I wasn't quite in the same position as Ed Balls and Anne Widdicombe and people like that. Um, but it was a fantastic experience. I mean, I you know, basically had six or seven lessons beforehand just to prepare, prepare the dance. And it was quite a bad time. I mean, the, the whole lot of um, really bad things were happening in the coalition at that time. We just had the tuition fee issue, my, my problems with News International, various things of that kind. And, and it came as a bit of light relief in the middle of it. Um, but it was actually very t intense. I mean, you, you, you know, you don't rerun it. You know, you, it's all live in real time. And I'd completely messed up the dress rehearsal. But fortunately, the final went quite well, and I got a 10 from Len and a 10 from Craig, I think, as well, amazingly. <laughs> so it, it, it turned out well, and uh, people now remember me for that. They have no idea what I did in the coalition government <laughs> for five years, but they do remember that. Love it. Thanks. Love it. Thank you very much, Vince Cable. Thanks. Coming up. Employment Minister Guy Opperman. If you have a baby under 24 weeks, you can't uh, validate its existence. You can't have a birth certificate or a death certificate. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult, uh, and this certification of life or death, particularly when they're stillborn. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> 
Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, the media establishment will stop at nothing to reverse Brexit. In my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the BBC, who are planning to dumb down their content to attract viewers. The channel which brings you pointless is getting more pointless by the day. My Mark Meets guest is legendary ex-Tory MP Sir Gerald Howarth. And in the big question, could smaller parties decide the next election? I'll be asking Anne Widdicombe and Vince Cable. Plus, Big Sam Allardyce on the football. We're live at nine. Guy Opperman, Conservative MP since 2010. Um, we're going to start this interview by talking about a tough period in your life, a tough period for you and your wife, Flora, who gave birth to Teddy and Rafe. You lose them both in 2020. Can you tell me what happened after Flora had given birth? Well, it was a very long week in St Thomas's Hospital, and we chose St Thomas's so I could do it because it's right next to the House of Commons. And her birth was quite complicated. Her pregnancy was quite complicated. It was a very long week where we tried to keep the boys alive, and uh, one came and went rather quickly. And then we spent four or five days trying to keep the second child alive, and sadly, um, that didn't happen. And so we spent a long week in the hospital, and. I couldn't really be there beforehand because of COVID and I certainly I wasn't able to attend any maternity um, appointments whatsoever. And as a consequence of that, I felt sort of that I was uh, not as engaged or as helpful or as, and you go through the process of, could I have done anything more to help her or them to survive? And you come to terms with that over a period of time. Do you think the expectations on men going through such a traumatic process are different to the expectations placed on mums? Well, I think mums, that we're on a journey, aren't we? So 20 years ago, even you know, 10 years ago, uh, people lost children and it was a very matter of fact, these things happen, move on, don't worry, you'll have further children. Whereas everybody now accepts, I hope, that there is great trauma for the woman in particular, for obvious reasons, but the parents, the father, uh, the partner, goes through just as much trauma and sadness and is almost, it's the inability to do anything about it because men are great trying to, so we try to solve problems and fix stuff. And it's that incapacity to do anything is very, very frustrating and very saddening and you have to come to terms with that. Uh, but listen, we've all been on a journey. It is way, way better as a society, as a health service, and as an acceptance um, between adults of the trauma of baby loss than it ever, ever was before. 
Do you think there are any public policy changes that could have made such a terrible experience any any easier? Have we come far enough as a society? So there's, there's an awful lot that w many of us are doing as to campaign on this. So as part of Baby Loss Awareness Week and a variety of charities and campaigns that are being run by some esteemed charities, I think there's a few things. The first would be a sort of uniformity of care throughout the country. So if you have a traumatic incident and lose a child in X trust, you can be treated very differently in Y trust. And that's not necessarily because they're, they're worse or that they are better. It's because there just isn't really the standard practice. There isn't the degree of teaching and learning across different trusts. There isn't the specializations that we probably need to have. You need to go forward down the route that people have did with stroke and various other health uh, policies in the past. And there are certain key things. So um, if you have a baby under 24 weeks, you can't uh, validate its existence. You can't have a birth certificate or a death certificate. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and this certification of life or death, particularly when they're stillborn, uh, is very, very hard. And I've talked about it in the House of Commons recently in the debate during Baby Loss Awareness Week. And that sort of stuff needs to change and is in the process, I believe, of being changed. Did you feel any pressure to go back to work sooner than you were ready? So I was a government minister at the time. I was taking forward two pieces of legislation, uh, one of which was in relation to the triple lock. And uh, I was, no one else could do the legislation. And I had about, I took a week off when, and the house was sitting at that time, uh, when the boys got sick and then died. And then I went back to work, slowly but surely. Um, I think uh, it's a very difficult job to say you're not going to go back to work. For you, you know, you've done this job just as much as I have. And you ha kind of have to crack on with it. I had a lot of support from colleagues, but also you just need to get on with it to a certain degree. Now, I'm quite a robust character in that respect. Um, I, I know that my wife would never have been able to go back to work that quickly. And many other couples uh, would have really, really struggled. So there is a great deal of pressure um, in an employment situation that needs to be understood. And there is a bill going through the House of Commons in the private members bill uh, that I very much support, which has, uh, when you have a neonatal loss, that there is a degree of uh, time off. Certainly, the next day I was utterly useless as a minister, as a member of parliament. Will the government support those measures? I think they are. It's still, I think, in a process, as you know, with PMBs, it's in a process of negotiation, but I believe they are, yes. Did you seek counselling? Did you have to take any medication? Those are personal questions and you don't have to answer them if you don't. No, no, it's fine. I didn't take any medication. Um, we had a little bit of counselling. Um, the main thing, we, we counselled each other. I think you, you really understand your marriage. You really understand a relationship. You, are, you try and be as kind as you possibly can to your partner, but also yourself. And being kind to yourself is probably the most important thing. And it is so easy to get into a circle of blaming yourself or blaming circumstances or seeking to blame others. And, you know, bad things happen to good people. It, it, this is not a... It's not a fair world. Do you mark their birthdays in... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Birthday? Yes. Um, so, uh, very much so. I mean, it's a birth fest, because obviously it was over a week-long period, and we are very much uh, celebrate and remember them. And um, uh, it helped. We bought a very adorable Fox Red Labrador to... Um, basically take our mind off it, went straight out and bought a, a Labrador. We talked about it for ages. I bought a Labrador who is the most spoiled dog in the world. And so the kind of, uh, her gotcha day is pretty much uh, their birthday. And um, yes, you, you don't forget this. It stays, I've met mums, because I'm now a big campaigner on this, I've met mums and dads who 30, 40 years on are still traumatised and remembering and commemorating the loss of their child. Some who whom didn't get over the line because, you know, the miracle is that, so Flora uh, could not give birth uh, in a normal way, had to have IVF. Now, IVF is a miracle thing, but I, I've met parents who are 30 to 40 years old, older than I am, who had one shot and couldn't do it again. 
for obvious reasons. Yes. And that is very, very difficult for them. Obviously, if you can move on, try and have further children, try and build your life, then life gets a lot easier. But you don't ever, ever forget the experience. And, you know, I always say that I have had three children. I've just had one take-home child. And you have Christopher now. You do indeed. Four months ago, Christopher was born. Joyful, uh, but must be particularly joyful. I wonder if... And exhausting. And exhausting. I can't, under the eyes. I look terrible. <laughs> I wish I had a ton of makeup. They don't have any makeup yet. Oh, I've, got, I've got enough for both of us on. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, when you have lost two children, do you feel anxiety about your take-home child? Or do you just feel it... Uh... Um, yes, I think any parent is struck by how remarkably um, fragile their child is. And you suddenly realise that awful burden of responsibility in a way that is way, way uh, more than you ever thought it would be. I think... Clearly, uh, you worry that this may be your only shot at this, um, but also, uh, slightly, when you've been through the, the trauma that we've been, it actually makes parenting easier, because slightly, you don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. And I try and live my life, particularly since 2011 and I had a brain tumour, um, not worrying about things that are clearly aggravating, upsetting, or... You know, him, I had a particular incident where I was meant to be giving, and you'll know this, I was meant to be giving a speech on Saturday night in my constituency, and I was wearing a nice jacket and a nice pair of trousers and a nice pair of shoes, and I held said child, and he vomited all over me. <laughs> you mentioned that you'd had a brain tumour. Yeah, I've had all the injuries. Um, so, I mean, I broke 22 bones as a jockey, and when I was a lot thinner, and I've got a reconstructed shoulder, I've got a splenectomy scar here because I had, no, my spleen was taken out after a fall at Stratford. And then uh, I was doing the budget in 2011, and I often say the budget nearly killed me. And I collapsed in central lobby, and uh, I had a brain tumour the size of about your fist, so a lady's fist on the sort of back left of my head. And a nice surgeon called Neil Kitchen uh, took it out with basically a small chainsaw. They, 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 if, you, if you're about to have your lunch, apologies. Basically, they cut your scalp open, your skull open, uh, with a chainsaw, basically, and uh, kind of lift that open, take a smaller chainsaw, uh, cut out the tumour, and uh, then literally staple you back together. After, by the way, after they an operation where they open your femoral artery, pop a line up through your aorta and because you the worry is you're going to bleed to death because it's quite tricky when you bleed in your head so they use a soldering iron basically they have a posh word for it but it's a soldering iron and they singe the base of the tumor before they uh, chop it out sorry about that but that's that, <laughs> so i'm not very keen on chainsaws anymore and saws generally i'm not i wouldn't be very good on anything where i had to be like a forester goodness me Whew. That's um, uh, awakened all of our senses yeah. in a very it graphic way. You Thank goodness you're but, all right. Well, listen, when you have a cancer, uh, you just want to cut out. You yeah. know, you know, so they give you the consenting chat. So uh, if, you're, if you're being consented in a hospital, they have to say, look, we're going to give you a general anaesthetic. There, we're going to be obviously putting a chainsaw to your head, which is not exactly the most simplest of procedures, and you could bleed out, and we could basically okay. cut your... Oh. Um, you could lose your sight, speech, Gosh. right side is particularly the likely thing you'd lose. And they give you a percentage on all this, and I'm adding it up, and it goes, well, there's 1% for this, and 1% for that, and 3% for that. It came about 8%, something disastrous would happen. But obviously, if you don't have the cancer cut out, you die in six months. So it's a no-brainer, you just crack on. And I hope his chainsaw hand is good. We all do. Yeah. Um, a final question. And I guess mums who, who are members of parliament get asked this a lot, but perhaps not dads. Um, so I want to ask you, as a new dad with a four-month-old child, is parliament and its working practices family-friendly? I think they try to be, but they've got a long way to go. It is not a uh, family-friendly job per se. And it's, um, you know, the, the House of Commons, the building itself, is definitely not family-friendly. Um, 
it is very, very tough to have a baby in the House of Commons. Now, several mums and several dads, and I'm having to do it from time to time, uh, are trying to do that. It's not easy. And, and I think that explains sometimes why some people just go, look, at the work-life balance is too complicated. You're seeing several mums, for example, beginning to think about, am I going to continue and stay and do this very tough job? in circumstances where, you know, you've done this job. It's a 60 hour a week job. It's very tough to bring up children, be in two places at once, and also manage childcare and children in circumstances where you're trying to be as good as an MP as you want to be, but also you're trying to be as good a parent as you want to be. Now, lots of people have those problems, but there's no doubt that doing that in the public eye is very complicated. If there was one change that could be made to how Parliament works, I think it's more back office support for those parents who have um, children so that uh, in reality it, is, it works better for them and possibly some sort of parental pairing um, that would be. But the whips are trying to work on that, to be honest. But then you get to tight votes, then things get complicated. You know that as well as I do. Really, real pleasure to chat to you. Thank you for your openness. My pleasure. And... Um, Good luck with um, the effects of the chainsaw, <laughs> but more importantly with um, four-month-old Christopher. Yeah, the chainsaw doesn't matter, the four-year-old does. Thank you. You've been watching Gloria Meets. Join me every Sunday at six o'clock, only on GB News. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking cold and cloudy for many with showers feeding in from the east. Let's take a look at the details. In the southwest, it'll be mostly dry, but there could be a few showers. There should also be a few breaks in the cloud. In the southeast, it'll be largely cloudy. The cloud will stop temperatures from dropping too low, but it will be cold with some rain too. Much of Wales will have a dry evening with the best chance of any clear skies in the southwest, with showers further northeast. It'll be a cloudy end to the day across the Midlands. Some showers are likely, but they will be intermittent and mostly light. It'll be a different story in the northeast. The showers will be frequent and heavy at times. The showers could fall as sleet or snow over higher ground. Western parts of Scotland will stay mostly dry with clear skies, meaning it will be cold. Further east, we can expect more cloud and wintry showers this evening and overnight. Meanwhile, across Northern Ireland, we can expect some showers, mainly towards northern and western parts, with some clear spells in between, but perhaps not as chilly as last night. Showers will continue to feed in from the northeast overnight with chillier and clearer weather in the west. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11pm on GB News.